And here's the good news. You are not alone. Wherever you are, whatever your living arrangements, however your life is going, you are not alone because of the one who came at Christmas time, Jesus, whose name was Emmanuel. This is from the Gospel of Matthew in the first chapter of the 23rd verse. He will be called Emmanuel, which is God with us, which is the great desire of God and the great need of the human heart. That's what we're gonna be talking about as we journey towards Christmas. And every day when you get one of these videos, there's also some very cool artwork Tim Williams arranged for this that will, um, depict what we're going to be talking about on that day. So if you're able to look at that, and it is an added bonus at no extra charge. There's an article in the Financial Times just in the last couple of days by uh, Frederica Coco, and the title of it is, Are We Prepared for the Approaching Loneliness Epidemic? And you might have thought that given what COVID did to isolate us and the fact that it's pretty much over at this point, that we would be increasingly free of loneliness. But she writes that actually way beyond just COVID, as dire as that has been, we're still learning about uh, educational deficits that may be a year or two in the lives of our young people that we don't know how to make up. Still trying to figure out what will going back to work look like and will offices be places where people will gather together. But beyond that, she says, there is a trajectory of loneliness, an arc of loneliness, interestingly enough, mostly in wealthier, what we think of as developed nations that has been going on for decades. Robert Putnam wrote Bowling Alone 20 years ago, uh, even centuries, it turns out centuries ago, even in the West, almost nobody lived in isolation. And now she looks at people who do, and in some Western countries, it's up to 60% of people Young people, she writes, are uh, at a very disturbing level compared to a decade ago, spending sometimes as many as eight hours a day being more isolated. And because of that, emotional health issues are more prevalent than ever. Suicide is on the rise. Ray Baumeister writes that, among other things, a sense of social exclusion, not just being alone, but feeling lonely, distorts our sense of reality the Princeton thinker Hannah Arndt wrote that uh, loneliness is fertile grounds for terrorism. And we see that all around us. And this article talks about how it is going to get worse, but it doesn't have to. We were not made to be alone. God's great longing is to be with us. And really the cure for loneliness ultimately is not social or educational or financial, it's spiritual. We see the beginnings of it um, in the Bible in the early days, in the fall, when God comes to be with Adam and Adam does not want to be with God. And God asks, where are you? He's reflect, inviting Adam to reflect on uh, Adam's decisions and Adam's well-being. And Adam's response was, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And we have been hiding from God. I hide from God in my mind when I want to do something that uh, I don't want God to be a part of when I would like to uh, retain my capacity to lie in case I need it or when I want to indulge in some lust or some greed, then I shut God out of my thoughts. And because I become fragmented inside myself, I'm no longer able to deeply be with other people also. And so God devised a way to address this problem. And the God of the universe, the God who made everything, became a human being and entered into our lives so that that old problem, I heard you, God, I was afraid. I was afraid that you would hurt me. I was afraid that you would make me miss out. I was afraid that if I was around you, uh, then my well-being wouldn't be taken care of so that we could know we did not have to be afraid of that God. He came in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, a little baby in a manger. And I love this picture. This is from Richard Mao, uh, philosopher, former president of Fuller Seminary. He talks about one time for Christmas when he was a little kid, our teacher had arranged for Santa to make a dramatic entry during an afternoon. Uh, we were sitting at our desk during our, doing our kindergarten thing when suddenly the door burst open and in came a large bearded man in a red suit with white trimming. Ho, 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 boys and girls. He continued to shout, I'm here to find out who's been naughty, who's been nice this year. 
Rich writes, I was terrified. And I was aware of the fear that my classmates also felt. Santa sat in the chair that the teacher offered him in front of the class. Again, he spoke in what seemed to my five-year-old ears like a thundering voice. I would like you children to take turns sitting on my lap, and I'm going to ask you questions about what you'd like for Christmas, and I want to check to see whether you deserve to receive any presents at all. Who will be first? Santa scanned the room. Nobody made a move. Finally, he pointed his finger straight at me. That young man, you come sit in my lap. Reluctantly, I made my way to his chair. Then an important thing happened. The person playing the role of Santa that day, as it turned out, was a man from our church, Mr. Cooper. I knew him well, although I did not recognize him in his disguise. Sensing my fright, Santa whispered in my ear in a gentle voice that only I could hear, Richard, it's okay. It's me, Mr. Cooper. Don't be afraid. And then Richard said, I could be okay. Then I knew it was all right. There's a very remarkable statement at the end of the Gospel of John in the 20th chapter, when John tells about his purpose in writing. He said, Jesus performed many, many more signs that are in this book, but these are written in order that you might believe or trust, lean wholly on the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. We sometimes think of Christ as his last name, but it wasn't. It meant the anointed one. The Son of God, John says, the, the one who created and is the Lord of everything. But this man, Jesus of Nazareth, the humble carpenter, the rabbi, the friend of sinners, the healer, uh, this is that. This Jesus is the Christ. You don't have to be afraid. It's me. That's the good news of Christmas. Not just that there is a God, but when we read the story of Jesus, this lowly, humble, loving, courageous, astonishing person whom death could not defeat, uh, he is the one who rules over all things and wants to be with us. So, the goal of today is to seek to be with him, to put into practice the Emmanuel principle. One of the people that we'll look at, at least sometimes as we're doing this journey together towards Christmas, is a man named Frank Laubach. Frank Laubach was a remarkable human being. He had, I think, a PhD in sociology, went to Princeton, Columbia. He was a missionary in the Philippines. He had been there for 15 years, suffered great loss, two children had died, a lot of career disappointment. And he was deeply uh, discontented with his own experience of life and God. So he began an experiment to see how much he would be able to make his life a journey together with God. We do that mostly in our minds. Hey, what a wonderful thing. The sun is coming out. This is part of what he writes. This is in a book called Letters by a Modern Mystic, where he traces this journey. He says, for the past few days, I have been experimenting in a more complete surrender than ever before. I am taking by a deliberate act of the will enough time from each hour to give God much thought. Yesterday and today I have made a new adventure which is not easy to express. I am feeling God in each movement by an act of will, willing that he shall direct these fingers that now strike this keyboard, willing that he shall pour through my steps as I walk. The scriptures would often talk about the Emmanuel principle as walking with God. Willing that he shall direct my words as I speak, my very jaws as I eat. You will object to this intense introspection. Do not try it unless you feel dissatisfied with your own relationship with God. But at least allow me to realize all the leadership of God I can. I am disgusted with the pettiness and futility of my unled self. I am disgusted with the pettiness and futility of my unled self. 
If the way out is not more perfect slavery to God, then what is the way out? Paul speaks of our liberty in Christ. I am trying to be utterly free from everybody, free from my own self, but completely enslaved to the will of God every moment of the day. And Frank Laubach began uh, a remarkable journey. In the process of doing this, he discovered a method for teaching literacy. That's part of what he was doing in the Philippines where he was, where someone would become able to learn and then they would teach somebody else. The world literacy movement, each one teach one, that began with Frank Laubach, but really it began with his life with God. So today, as you walk through the day, allow the thought to come back. Emmanuel. Jesus is saying, hey, it's me. Don't be afraid. And then ask God, would you pour into my very steps as I walk? And the words that I say, make today an experiment in life with God. You are not alone. Hey, thanks for joining us. To receive a text alert when new episodes are released, you can text the word BECOME to the number 855-888-0444. You can also send prayer requests there, and we would love to pray for you. To receive the emails that go along with each video, let us know at becomenew.me slash subscribe. Special thanks to Matthew Custer for the art and design for this series. See you next time.